a bit of an overview in statistics. This is going back to year 11 content. There are heaps of different ways that we categorize data. So we're gonna have a look at this diagram. We always start with some piece of data. We can then break data down into being either categorical or numerical. Now, what do I mean by this? Categorical data is data that exists in categories like the color of someone's hair, their eye color, a color of a car, the, um, let's see, color of the shirt they're wearing, the name of their child, their um, country of origin. It is a category, right? We then break down categorical into nominal and ordinal. Before we do that, let's have a look at numerical. Numerical data is numbers. You can count it. So it's the number of um, shirts that somebody owns, the number of cars that somebody owns, the number of pets that somebody owns, the number of people in a room, anything that is countable. That's then broken down into discrete and continuous. So when it comes to categorical nominal, think about the no, N-O, no order of categories. So this is data where the categories do not exist in any intrinsic order. It could be the color of somebody's eyes, the color of their car, the color of their hair. There's no intrinsic order to that. However, ordinal categorical or categorical ordinal is categories that have intrinsic order. So think about the rankings, first, second, third place at a dance competition, A, B, C, D, E, F on, an, on a report, something that has an intrinsic order. Numerical data is broken down into discrete and continuous. Discrete data is data that takes exact numerical values. So you can't have 1.5 children. You can only have one or two children. So it's an exact whole value. Continuous data is any numerical value within a range. So you can weigh 65.217 kilograms or you can weigh 65.2174 kilograms. Any numerical value within a range. That's numerical continuous. We also have a bunch of different ways of collecting data. We can collect data about every individual in the whole population by doing a census. We have an Australian census that runs every four years. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. That's a census. That's a very uncommon way of collecting data because you have to collect about every individual in the entirety of a population. What we're more likely to see is a sample. Sample is a way of collecting data about a portion of the population. So you might just sample 10 people from each community. A biased sample is data that has been unfairly influenced by the collection process. So it's not truly representative of the population. This might be if we have um, an interview about whether people like reality TV, but we only interview people who we know like reality TV. That is a biased sample. A self-selected sample is when there's a voluntary response. So say you post um, a survey on your school forum and people choose to fill it out. Random sampling is when every member of a population has an equal chance of being selected. So you say, um, I'm going to pick five names out of a hat of this people of this class of 20, and the five of you are going to fill out the survey. Stratified random sampling is when sample the sample is made up of random samples taken from subgroups. So you might pick five random people from each year 12 class, and they are the subgroups of the year 12 cohort. Systematic sampling is when every member of the population is put in order and then every certain number of person is chosen. So we say, I'm going to put everyone in alphabetical order and every fifth person is going to be chosen. So this is all, like I said, year 11 content. This isn't explicitly tested, but it's going to be at the base of your stats questions. Frequency distribution tables. So we use frequency distribution tables to help us display data. Few different rules. Have a look at this table. What do we notice? Number one, classes cannot overlap. See how it doesn't say zero to one pet, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, because where would somebody with four pets go? Do they go in here or do they go in here, right? You can only have classes that do not overlap. For these classes, you would say 10 to 19, 20 to 29 and so forth. Even if a number has no data, if it's included in the set, it must be included in the table. So if they say people were surveyed about whether they had zero to six pets, if no one has six pets, you still have to include six, zero, zero. Each interval must also be the same size. So you can't write zero to one, two to seven, eight to nine, because those intervals are not the same size. So this example here shows you the number of pets a tally of how many people have that number of pet and the frequency. We write the frequency based on the tally. It's not cumulative yet. I know you guys know what cumulative frequency is. We're gonna have a look at it now. That was just frequency. 
Cumulative frequency is the sum of all of the frequencies of the scores. So let's have a look at this table. It is literally just if you have all the frequency, adding them up and putting them in each column. So 2 is 2, 2 plus 5 is 7, 2 plus 5 plus 4 is 11, 2 plus 5 plus 4 plus 2 is 13, 2 plus 5 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 14. Sum of all of the frequencies of the scores. Relative frequency is the number of times a score occurs as a fraction of the total number of scores. So let's do a question. How many people have the score of three? Well, there's four people who have that score. There's 14 total scores. Four over 14 is the relative frequency of a score of three. If you were asked for the percentage relative frequency, you represent it as a percentage. So four over 14 in our calculator gives me 0.285, so I would probably say 29%. I'm going to give you guys just a second to screenshot those um, definitions or to jot them down. Okay, let's have a look at dot plots. Dot plots are super simple. You are just writing your scores along the bottom and placing the relative number of dots above it. So this is an example. In this example, it means that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people take 10 minutes to eat breakfast. One person takes 12 minutes. Two people will take eight minutes. No one takes six or seven minutes, so on and so forth. So stem and leaf plots, you're going to actually imagine stems and leaves. So every number on the left is a stem and every number on the right is a leaf attached to that stem. So it's a really, really easy way of not having to write out the first number of a number every single time. So instead of having to write out 52, 56, 57, 57, 58, you can just write 5, 2, 6, 7, 7, 8. So in this, that's 63, that's 66, that's 10, that's 31, that's 49, so on and so forth. Okay, quick refresh on the rules with our column line and bar graphs. Number one, always double check your horizontal and vertical axis. You have to make sure the correct di data is in the correct spot. Have you got your horizontal on your, um, is your horizontal axis your independent variable? You have to make sure they're labeled as well. You always need to make sure your scale starts at zero. And if it doesn't, you have to have that line that demonstrates that you're going like this. You're skipping zero and you're starting at 20, for example. I'll show you that in a couple slides. You also need to make sure that the scale of your data is regular and increases by the same amount every time. So you can't write 5, 10, 50, 100. It has to be the same increase between each piece of information. You cannot change your scale halfway through. The two um, axes can have different scales. So this one could be up by one number each time. This one could be up by 50 numbers each time, but they have to be the same on each. So this one can't switch to 50. This one can't switch back to one. If you do, um, when you do draw your lines, try and use a ruler and make sure that they're exactly following each point. So you don't have like a grapes bar that goes down like this. Okay. Frequency histograms and polygons. A histogram is a graph. So it can be a column graph or a bar graph in which the values of the variable are placed on the horizontal axis and the frequency of the variable is on the vertical axis. So there's no gaps between the columns. What's important is you remember with a frequency histogram, you don't need the gaps. With a column line or bar graph, you do need the gaps. With a frequency polygon, that is a line graph that is just made by joining the midpoints of any column in a frequency histogram. You start in the bottom left corner of the first bar and you end in the bottom right corner of the last bar. You hit the top of each bar and if there's no data, you hit the bottom of the axis. A cumulative frequency histogram is a histogram that uses cumulative frequency on the vertical axis instead of just frequency. So it's always going to be going up and it demonstrates that this jump to this jump is the amount of people that did this point it's just adding to this point so they didn't actually there weren't actually 18 people who had that length it's just the difference between how many people had this length and how many people had this length i know it's kind of difficult to understand but if you need to go back and revise this content i would recommend doing so right sooner rather than later you'll see in this one we had a little jump straight to 20 and we indicated that with a line that looks like this that is allowed you just have to do that line 
A cumulative frequency polygon would be if we drew a histogram and then joined the upper right hand corners of each column of that histogram. So if it looked something like this, the cumulative frequency histogram would just look like that. Pareto charts. Pareto charts follow the 80-20 rule. So basically 80% of the study you do will allow you to achieve about 20% of the marks that you do in the final exam. The other 80% of your marks are going to come from 20% of the studying you do, which is more likely to be that really active study like the practice papers. They combine a vertical column graph and a cumulative frequency, relative frequency graph. So this line is showing you the cumulative relative frequency as we follow this line. So if we go down to 80, 80% 80 of all defects come from button defect, pot and de pocket defect, and the a little bit of collar defect. So cuff defect and sleeve defect are not responsible for 80% of problems. Okay.